Let me introduce you. It's my wife, Barbara. Go for it. Paul and I just met 10 years ago. Just as a little background, we were not beekeepers. I grew up with a beekeeper. My father had bees for 80 years. He died at 88. He got his first hive at 80. And when he died, there were two hives in his yard um, in North Carolina. He um, loved bees. I didn't. Uh, when I would go running through the grass in the summer barefooted with my brother, I'd step on those little balls of clover. Didn't realize my dad was letting the clover grow higher and not cutting the grass because he was trying to feed his bees. And I would step on it and get stoned. So I didn't have a lot of bees. But uh, I did love the honey. Oh my goodness. When you taste your first honey, or if you are accustomed to having honey that has come from a beekeeper and not, uh, not off the shelf in the store that says Sue B or whatever, it, it's wonderful. Uh, when, when we were young, I remember my father bringing home a little jar of Sue B honey one day just so we could taste the difference. And we tasted it, it went, <coughs> you know, horrible. And I realize now we were, um, like wine connoisseurs for honey. We were honey connoisseurs. I still am. Love good honey. Never thought about being bee, a beekeeper until my husband, at some point, after we met 10 years ago, a few years later, he says to my dad, I'm kind of interested in keeping some bees. And I went, oh, what? <laughs> well, he ultimately became my father's uh, favorite son or son-in-law because he started doing the bees. Well, what I want to talk about today is uh, a year in the hive. Um, that doesn't just mean a year inside the box. Um, my talk to you is more about not only what's happening in the hive all through the year, but what you as a beekeeper should and or can be doing. Um, <clears throat> kind of remember how this works. <laughs> ah, all right. There's our first bees. This is a bamboo pole. That's an old metal bucket my father had nailed to the bamboo pole. And above that, it's a little hard to see, is a swarm. We were at my father's one day doing nothing but a garden project, and I saw a cloud of bees in the sky. I said, Daddy, what's happening? There are bees everywhere. And he realized one of his hives was swarming, and they all settled up there. And he said, Come on, Paul, I'm going to take you to school. He got the he got the uh, pole out and made Paul. Yeah, point to, to the machine. Over okay, there. okay. I just. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he made Paul take that bamboo pole with the bucket and shove it up under that ball of bees, and the ball of bees fell in the bucket. So here's my father taking Paul to school. <laughs> He put a little um, new hive there, empty. Daddy had lots of equipment. He had, he had had over 100 hives of bees, so, uh, and he used to sell equipment just like the gentleman that was here, plus other stuff, uh, out of his barn. So he had plenty of equipment. But, um, so he had Paul lower the thing down. Now, they didn't even take time to get bee suits or anything. Paul lowered the bucket down, dumped them out in the street there, and the bees just walked quietly into the nuke. <laughs> they weren't interested in stinging anybody. Anybody want to hazard a guess why? Well, um, for bees to swarm, they are not sure when they're going to get their next meal. So when they get the swarm instinct and they're ready to go, they fill their bellies up with honey. 
so that they have energy for a few days before they can forage again uh, to go hang in a tree till the scouts go out and find a good place to live. So when bees are full of honey, they're more docile, uh, which is why you smoke them when you work a hive. The smoke makes them think the woods are on fire. They go fill their bellies up with honey in case they have to fly away and leave the hive. And they're docile, uh, like how you guys are going to feel right now that you just had lunch. You're going to feel a little lazier. Anyway, um, I just have to keep remembering which button to push here. Uh, so we took that hive home. This is just one of the one of the uh, sons we got in a bee suit just for the picture that day. But um, took the hive home, and we thought, now we're beekeepers. Um, little did we know there was a lot more to learn, but we, we have learned since um, and are still learning. May never learn what all we need to know. <coughs> um, I, sh I should have said a minute ago when, when I had the picture up, let me just see if I can make this work backwards. Um, when we got the hive of bees home, you know, we didn't know really what to do with it, except we loved watching them come and go. And every now and then, we'd get a suit on, go out there, smoke them, take the lid off, and look. And we'd say, yep, there are bees in there. But we didn't have any sort of plan for what we were looking for, what we should be doing. Had no idea. But that didn't take away the enjoyment of having them. I mean, it was fun to have them. <laughs> About two years later, uh, I attended, uh, uh, or we both attended the Eastern Apiculture Society meeting. That's the whole Eastern Seaboard gets together for a convention that lasts a week. If you want to stay the whole week, there are workshops in there. It's a wonderful learning experience. My favorite speaker at that, um, that year was Kent Williams. He's from Kentucky. And he did a talk, A Year in the Life of a Beekeeper. He talked about a plan of activities, goals, objectives for each month of the year. And it just it was like a light bulb dawning in my head. Oh, this is what I need to be doing. Um, he also stressed that uh, a beekeeper's calendar should be aligned more with the flora of the area, not just with what <coughs> month it is. Um, I guess you all know what I mean by the flora. The things that are blooming, that bees like to eat, they don't <coughs> like everything. Um, I was telling somebody back there that I was sitting close to, there's a housing development close to us um, that would have been a great place for wonderful bee trees, bushes, whatever, and the only thing the developers planted in every yard of this enormous cedar leaf, anybody knows where that is, maybe somebody lives there. Anybody here live in cedar leaf development? <laughs> it's on uh, Cedar Lane. But um, in that development, in every yard, there are two Bradford pear trees, the absolutely worst forage tree. They're, they stink and they have no food value for honeybees. So one of the things you're gonna need to be learning as a beekeeper is what bees like to eat. Bradford pears are not it. So that whole area is just taboo for the honeybees. Um, when things bloom, and that varied quite a bit. Oops, that to my, oh, bloom periods. That has varied quite a bit in the last two years. If some of you don't remember, if you were here two years ago, March, that be two years, one year ago. March 2012 was about the second warmest in history around here. You remember how early it got hot a year ago? And the opposite happened this year, how cold it was this year? Um, all right, so in March of 2012, redbud trees, and that's, anybody, do y'all know what a redbud tree is? It's a, a native, wonderful native tree that'll just grow up in the woods. But uh, a lot of people actually plant them. They make a nice decorative tree in your yard. Red bud trees have a purple-looking bloom. It's one of the first things that blooms in the spring, early in the spring. 
Um, I've been digging them up out of the woods from my neighbor's property and planting them in my yard this year. <laughs> and they have a heart-shaped leaf. They're wonderful. But um, red buds bloomed early in March, and I got to where I started writing down on the calendar, you know, when things bloomed, trying to keep up from year to year. But here again, last year and this year were so different, one in comparison. Red buds this year bloomed the second week of April. That was almost six weeks different. And it makes a huge difference in your beehive. Because when those things are blooming and it's warm, the queen starts ramping up and laying lots of eggs, and all of a sudden they'll get too full before you know it and be swarming away on you. So you have to be conscious of, of those sorts of things. Uh, I don't know when hollies bloom this year. I happen to have written it down last year, but eight apples last week of March last year, mid-April this year. So those kind of things kind of need to keep up with. One of our senior beekeepers in our club used to ask this question. Are you going to be a beekeeper or a bee haver? If you're just a bee haver, you're like we were that first summer. We had a hive of bees. But if you're going to be a keeper, there are jobs, things you need to do to take care of them, take care of their health, try to keep them alive, enjoy them, work on honey. Um, so you have to decide. <clears throat> Talking about each month of the year now, and we'll start with August. We look at August uh, almost as the start of the beekeeper's calendar. Um, reason being, what you do in August and the late summer and in the fall has a large impact on whether or not your bees are going to survive the winter. <clears throat> Definitely you need to be inspecting hives in August. Just understand it's hot. You don't feel like putting on that hot suit, but do it anyway. Or do it like uh, one of our beekeepers uh, works her bees in hot weather before 9 a.m. if you have that luxury. Um, problem. It's a little problematic for people that work five days a week. Paul and I are retired and we can pick and choose our, our pretty days to work bees. It needs to be a pretty day, you know, summer, I mean a sunny day preferably, not a lot of wind. Uh, no, definitely no raining. Never open a beehive when it's raining. Bees don't fly in the rain. They get their, bee, their wings wet and they can't fly. So if you open a hive when it's raining, every 50,000 bee is home and um, they will not appreciate it at all. They will be very aggressive. But on a nice warm day above 55 degrees, sunny, um, of course, here again, we're talking August, so you've, you've uh, got to realize it's, it's a hot prospect to be a beekeeper in August. Just, just have your iced tea ready when you get done and turn your air conditioner up a little bit so you can cool off. By inspecting the hives, um, when I say you need to inspect them in August, what that means is that you don't just stand on your porch with your mint julep and look out there and see if they're still sitting there. You're going to actually go in the hive. You're going to um, take your smoker, do a little puff of smoke at the front, crack the lid, do a little puff of smoke under the lid, take the lid off, get your hive tool, because everything in there is going to be stuck together with propolis, that sticky stuff that bees fill up all the cracks with. Um, I hope I'm not blasting you all away. I'm trying to talk loud so they can hear me in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you take your hive tool, you crack the frames apart, take your frame gripper, or personally, I, I don't like using a frame gripper. I use my, my blade tool and crack the frames apart, and then I just take four fingers, lift a frame up, and I, I like to hold them in my hand. Um, this uh, frame that's being held by one of our beekeepers, um, uh, 
I don't think you can see it, maybe you can, but it's covered with bees. Typically when you take out a frame and look at it, those particular bees are not very aggressive either. They are comfortable just sitting there on the hive or walking around on the hive or continuing their little job. So you can just hold the frame and watch them. They don't just fly off at you. So um, you're going to be looking for things, especially in August. Uh, you're going to, first of all, look for a laying queen. Now, how do you do that? Well, you saw pictures of queens. Um, when you're looking at an actual hive, she doesn't just stand up and wave her little hand. She hides, and she's hard to spot, hard to find, whether she's got a dot of paint on her or not. There are many times Paul and I look at a hive and cannot find the queen. But as long as we find evidence that she's there, we're okay. We don't keep hunting until we're just melting out there in the heat. If we find evidence that she's been there in the last two or three days, we, we know she's been there in the last two or three days. Okay, how do you know that? Um, well, you look for her eggs. This is not a picture I took, came off the internet. These, these are the cells, honeycomb cells, and in each one is what looks like a little grain of rice. Can you spot that? Is the lighting all right where you can see little grains of rice? When you see that, if it's standing up straight, that little grain of rice, which is actually an egg, just got laid that day. And you know that queen was just walking on that frame that day and laid that egg. If, um, if it's lying down, if it's toppled over, it's somewhere from one to three days since she was there. After about three days, the little egg turns into a little pupa, larva, one of the well, two. Crescent-shaped larva. <laughs> okay, so that's one way to know if there's a queen if you don't see her. You got to remember, out of fifty thousand bees, there's only one queen. Your chance of finding her is poor. It takes practice, um, looking, and sometimes you have to look real quick. And then uh, sometimes bees cover her up. They, some other people this morning talked about her entourage. They're trying to protect her. I have actually spotted a queen pulling her little rear end up out of a cell where she had just laid an egg. And when, when, when her rear end is down in the cell and it's just her head showing, you have no idea that's a queen. But I've only seen that once. All right, one more thing about looking for eggs. Um, they're hard to see. I mean, this is magnified. So you got to have on your reading glasses if you need them, or you need a magnifying glass. They're hard to spot. They're probably impossible to see on a cloudy day. On a sunny day, you can take a frame, uh, a frame of what you think might have eggs on it. You can take a frame, stand with the sun shining over your shoulder, and tilt that hive just so that the sun goes down into the bottom of those holes, bottom of those cells, and then you might be able to see the eggs. And that also sort of takes practice to look for those. But if you don't see eggs, you look for larvae. Um, there, that's the baby bee before it's turned into a bee, before it's been capped over, it's usually C-shaped. These are rather large. These have grown a while. Sometimes you can spot them much smaller than that. Or look for capped brood. You want to be sure in August that you've got some bees ready to hatch out. All these little browns, brown cappings are, are covering up baby bees ready about ready to hatch out there are holes here which sometimes indicates that um, these bees are, are hygienic and they have determined that there was a baby bee in there that had too many mites or something and so they uncapped that hole and pulled out the sick bee and gotten rid of it but um but that's a pretty good brood pattern lots of brown cappings 
There's going to be a lot of bees hatch out of that frame in a few days. Up here, this white stuff is, are the wax cappings of honey cells because when you're raising baby bees, they want honey close by to feed them. Another thing you're looking for in August is to decide if you might have disease in your hive or problems. Um, uh, this particular, the, Ronnie's going to talk about diseases in a little bit, but I'll just go ahead and tell you that what this is, uh, the frame we pulled out one day, um, you can see the wax was chewed away. Well, wax moths do that. They will eat your wax and they leave spider webbing. It looks like spider webbing to me. Um, typically, a full hive of bees will keep wax moths chased out. They won't get in there. But if your hive of bees gets weak, and there are some frames that are unprotected, wax moths move in readily and damage the <coughs> frames. So that's one of the things you want to look for because if, if you have a frame like this and a hive in August, you can guarantee that hive will not survive the winter. It's already reduced in size and it's, you're going to have to do something. That, that something might be in a more advanced class than today. So. Oh, be sure to attend the bee club meeting. <laughs> All right, we're September. So good time, maybe August was a good time also, but when you're, when you're going into your hive in September, it's a good time to perform mite counts. The gentleman up here was talking about counting mites on that whiteboard under his hive. Uh, Paul and I do it differently. We do a sugar roll test where we put an inch of bees in a jar with a screen lid. We put some powdered sugar in there. We shake them up. We shake mites out of the lid and sugar onto a pan of water. The sugar dissolves and we can count how many mites are in the water. For, for whatever reason, uh, sugar on a bee's back will not let the mite stick to it. And so the mite falls off. Um, and you can see how many you have. All hives are going to have some mites, but it's not problematic unless it's over a certain number. And when it gets to that number, uh, you have to decide what sort of treatment you want to use to keep your bees healthy. There are varieties of treatments. Um, Combine wheat colonies. In September, when you, have, when you open up a box of bees and there are only two or three frames worth of bees there, there's not going to be enough to keep, keep the hive warm through the winter. So a lot of times we uh, combine wheat hives, put one together with another. You have to get rid of one of the queens, so you might want to decide, well, this queen's old anyway. I will just uh, take this newer queen and her brood and her hive and put it together with another. So essentially you would be condensing down from two hives to one, but that's better than losing two weak hives. Some people recommend instead of combining weak hives that you give the weak hive bees to a strong hive and then you have a good stronger hive. So that's different types of beekeeping. Uh, a lot of people order and replace queens in September. You definitely need to be feeding them so the uh, bees can build up their honey stores so they can eat on it during the winter. This is a picture of Paul stirring up syrup, sugar syrup. <laughs> this is a 25 pound bag of sugar. We buy lots of those from Costco. They look at us real funny when we're whittling out several bags of sugar. And we say, we're beekeepers. They want to know if we're making, what is it made? Moonshine. Moonshine. <laughs> but, uh, so he devised a great system. Uh, I thought about this while um, Wendy was talking about her drill. Paul put, has a drill in his hand and he bought this long apparatus, which is a paint stirrer and um, keeps it clean, keeps it just for the sugar syrup. And he puts a 25 pound bag of sugar in there and fills that five gallon bucket up with water. 
zzz, whirs that star around until it's all dissolved, and then uh, we feed several gallons of sugar to our bees about in the fall. Uh, that's just one way to feed them. Um, a, a jar feeder on the front. This is on the front of a little starter hive. When you start a new nook hive, um, anytime, in the summer or anytime, very often it's a good idea to feed them a little bit to get them a boost to get started. <clears throat> um, also, uh, in the fall is a good time to feed some sugar patties. A sugar patty can and this is a pollen patty, actually. This, this could actually be in the spring, but in the fall, um, when it starts getting too cold for um, liquid to be in the hive, uh, if you still want or your bees still need food, uh, there are recipes for making sugar patties you can lay on top of the frames and it uh, doesn't add moisture to the hive. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. I have a real passion for planting things that bees can eat because there's so much out there that bees cannot eat. They do not eat every kind of bloom that you see. And so uh, in your book on page 80, your book you got today, page 80, 81, there's a wonderful list of, um, of good bee food things to plant. And I figure if you care about honeybees and pollinators, Every year, start planting some of those things. I love to plant perennials because they keep coming back every year. This just happens to be um, sage. Lots of herbs are good, good for honeybees. Attend your club meeting. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing about that. You really need the network of a club. I, I know I'm advertising for our club, but there are other clubs in the area, in the region. There are two, in the, I think, in the Richmond area. Um, we have had members who were members of our club that were also paying members of two, uh, three other clubs. They attended every club meeting in the month, so they went to four a month. And you always learn something. You learn something new at every month. October, have bees well prepared to survive the winter. Check the weight of the hive by lifting the back. We actually walk up to the back of our hive body, put our hands under it, lift. If it's like that, you know, it's heavy, full of honey. If, if it just lifts right up, it's too empty, you know, they need food. They're going to need 60 pounds of honey, so if you can imagine picking up a 60-pound sack of feed, what that would feel like, that's what you're hive should feel like at this time of year. November, at least by November, um, we have done it this November, reverse the hive bodies. Somebody said earlier this morning that the queen keeps working upward, <coughs> and this is true. She'll lay her eggs in the bottom brood box, but uh, when that gets full and then those those uh, bees are starting to hatch out. She moves up into the top brood box and she lays eggs and then the bees are hatching out of there. She tends to want to stay there. So ideally what we want for winter is for the queen and the brood all to be in the bottom and the top brood box to be full of honey because through the winter the cluster gradually moves upward as it eats. Could you go back to October? <clears throat> what? <clears throat> and that, that is not a fine science. Some of these things can be done in the month before I listed it or the month after. It'll depend on the weather. It'll depend on your availability. Reduce colonies down to two hive bodies each if using deep hive bodies. That's what this is, and it's like that box over there. Uh, it's a deep hive body. That's a deep hive body. So there are two. These are two full colonies of bees. 
This one's not quite prepared for winter because we don't have the entrance reducer in there yet, but I don't remember exactly when this picture was made. I uh, pulled it out just to show you um, how, for the most part, that's what you're going to have going through the winter. Uh, one of our beekeepers pampers her bees. It's like they're like her pets. And so she, uh, every fall, puts hay bales around as a windbreak. <laughs> Seems to do a great job. She's, you can stand inside that uh, uh, area where the hay bale, you know, she makes a nice little curve. <laughs> you can stand inside there in the winter and uh, it feels warmer than outside. And so uh, she, she pampers hers. Um, need a rock on top, a rock, a brick, or we put a brick or something up there to keep the, the top cover from blowing off in cold winter winds, or any time, really. Summertime can have enough wind to blow the top of a high ball. Um, for some reason, she has her entrance reducer there uh, sticking out. I don't know why, but she has a uh, rock in front of it. <laughs> anyway, they're nice and toasty. Uh, entrance reducers do keep out mice. I was talking to somebody about that because in the winter time when the bees are all clustered up, um, they're not going to turn loose of their cluster to go sting a mice, a mouse, so a my, mouse can get in there and eat some of the honey. Um, this is too detailed to, I'm not going to talk a lot about all these temperatures. I was just trying to find a picture of a cluster in the winter. What this looks like is a three medium uh, hive body. Someone talked earlier about you can order medium um, hive bodies instead of the deep. And there, a lot of women like them because they're easier to handle for a woman or manipulate. Or maybe older people with bad backs. Um, but you do have to have three boxes of the mediums to have enough room for the bees to get through the winter. But typically a cluster of bees, it, it, when it's below 55 degrees, they cluster up in a ball. It's quite warm in the middle. That's where the queen will be and that's where the um, brood will be. And then it's other bees' job to circle around and around and around them. And, shiver their wing muscles and keep the, uh, the cluster warm. Eventually they run out of energy to do that and they just die and fall off. So where your cluster might be as big as a basketball in the fall, by spring it can be about the size of a baseball. <clears throat> this is a sad sight in the spring. What? Well, it's a frame. And you see bee butts. Those are not heads, those are butts. They're dead. We've seen that more than one time. <laughs> um, they're kind of in a shape of a baseball, uh, which I almost asked the questions at the end. Um, they, um, what they've done, uh, they had clustered up into that little ball and stuck their heads down in the holes to get the last little lick of honey that was in there. Now, what might have happened then, there was such a severe cold snap when they were in that position that they didn't have the strength or energy to come out and move where there might have been more honey over here or in the frames above them. We've actually had some bees die like that um, in the winter when there was a whole super of honey over the top of them. It depends on those terribly cold temperatures, how long they last and how small your size of, of your um, cluster is. Best thing to do, going back to what I said in the fall, is ensure that you have lots of bees in your hive going into the winter and they have a much greater chance of keeping warm and surviving. Another thing to do in the fall, which some of you might have done today, order packages of bees to be delivered in the spring. If you wait till spring um, to order them, it's harder to get them. You have a later start. They have more trouble getting built up. But if you order them now, you'll have them early and they'll be building up quick. 
another fall job cleaning store equipment. Um, Paul and I took off all these top feeders. <coughs> these are sugar syrup feeders, and we just <coughs> laid them here by the garage. They're they're uh, soaking, have water in them right now. Just haven't gotten to them to clean them up. All along the edges of these feeders are uh, propolis, and Paul likes to clean that stuff off before he puts them away. Um, somebody asked earlier, uh, where does this type feeder go? And the answer was on top of the hive, but no, not on top of the lid. There has to be a lid on top of the sugar syrup or you'll have everything in the world crawling in there and you'll have bees crawling in and drowning. But um, they get the syrup through the edges, not, they don't fly into it. Um, this is um, how we store our super frames. These are frames that we've already extracted the honey. We did that back in the summer. Um, we've stored them in um, tubs that we bought at Walmart and put a little bit of what are those moth crystals that it's all right to use? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, I recommend the fall, <laughs> attending the Fall State Beekeepers Association meeting. You may not know that that occurs, but we have a state association that meets twice a year, spring and fall. You can go there and hear new research, get updates on what's going on with beekeepers all over Virginia, meet national speakers, you can work on, they're starting a master beekeeping program. You can network with other state beekeepers, uh, buy products, and win door prizes. Attend your own club meeting. <laughs> now we're up to December. I can't remember who sent me this picture. Somebody, it's pretty clever, hang uh, Christmas wreaths on their beehives, I thought. Uh, good time to buy bee equipment, clothing for Christmas. Uh, you already heard somebody say that was on their Christmas list. You can, uh, we, we tend to get clothing and think, oh, I think I'd like that better. Oh, maybe I'll get that next Christmas. And we, Paul and I have a collection of a variety of kinds of clothing. Um, we have a Christmas, our, par, our club has a Christmas party. Um, some of our club members in the wintertime spend some time making candles. It's one of the things I, it's on my bucket list to do is to make beeswax candles. A lot of our club members do it, but I haven't started. What we do, we do have rendered wax, this, the um, shape of the pan that we uh, melted it down into, and um, uh, there's a gal uh, in Ashland who buys our wax from us and makes lip balm. Her um, company is called Max Mac. Her name is Mackenzie Phillips, I think. Mackenzie something. But anyway, she buys our beeswax. Um, January. If you haven't already done it, you need to start putting together your whoops. You need to start putting together your equipment. <coughs> um, don't wait until the trees are blooming and think, oh, I've got to hammer together my frames. You've already missed some of the good nectar flow. So this is a wintertime project. Read. Here's Paul working on repairing some frames, putting new nails in the ones that got weak, uh, building frames. You see some of these little parts and pieces. This is what you see when you order a hive. Um, you get all these little parts and pieces. <coughs> Uh, this book was mentioned earlier. Wintertime's a good time to read. I'm a, I'm a retired school teacher. I've got to tell you, there's a lot to learn about bees, a lot to learn about beekeeping. You need to uh, decide in your head if you want to keep bees, you need to become a lifelong learner. You can't just learn a little bit and stop because it's an evolving process and there's lots to learn. And it's a fascinating hobby if you'll uh, dig into it. There's when when you start reading about the behavior of honeybees, you're like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> so plan to do that. 
Um, our journals were mentioned earlier. You can get one of these a month, American Bee Journal or um, Bee Culture. They're not all that expensive, have lots of good research and interesting articles. Oh, they also have recipes. Where did I get to? 10 club meeting in January, first Thursday, 7 o'clock. <laughs> February. Okay, you need to be checking your colonies for honey stores. Uh, if, if they're light, you need to feed them something. Uh, feed hives that are low with sugar candy or dry sugar. Clean up dead colonies. On a warm day, you might go out and check. And on warm days above 55, the bees will start flying in and out and taking little cleansing flights. And if you go look at your bee yard, you got four hives, three have bees coming and going. One has none. It's a good time to open it up, discover that it's a die out, suck it up, move on, take it all apart, clean it up, don't let the moths eat it, store it away. March, continue feeding if necessary. Here again, depends on the weather. If we have a March like two years ago, everything was blooming, bees were rolling. This past March, not so much cold. Um, clean up dead colonies, remove some brood frame from, oh, um, if you have, when you start to have a really strong colony in the spring, bees get nervous about have, having their hive too full and they start thinking about dividing themselves. Um, so one way to prevent them from swarming themselves is to remove some brood frames from strong colonies to add to weaker ones. Lessens the instinct to swarm. Um, not sure why this was next, just uh, in, in warmer weather, Paul has this thing going constantly. It's just a passive solar wax melter uh, on a little stand. It's kind of an odd picture of it, but it's uh, there's old beeswax, like from dead outs, or when beeswax gets five years old, we don't reuse it. We start replacing with new um, wax foundation. But um, when, when it gets five years old or looks bad or whatever, he throws it in there and the sun just melts it. It runs through a little, um, runs down here and into a pan and you can put uh, screening or paper towels to um, filter it and makes a nice block of wax that you can use for your own use or candles or all sorts of things. Um, April. April, typically you're, that's when you're going to start seeing swarms. Bees are driven by instinct to make new queens and produce swarms. That's nature's way to propagate bee populations. If we weren't keeping the bees, they'd figure out how to divide and grow themselves. So, uh, but when you have bought a package of bees and made it through the winter with it, you don't want it leaving your yard. So um, you need to be aware if they're ready to swarm and there are techniques to try to reduce that happening and keep the bees home. Dividing them, making two hives out of one. It's one way. Be on the lookout for swarms. We just, one last April or a couple years ago, we looked out the kitchen window and there in this uh, maple tree was this enormous swarm. We didn't know for sure if it came out of our hive or whose. It was just uh, not very far from one of our hives, but um, uh, Paul managed to use this long pole with a clipper on the end and cut this uh, branch we laid a plastic sheet on the grass below it. Uh, the branch dropped onto the plastic sheet. The bees <coughs> are plopped off. <laughs> we There's the plastic. And set a, a box there. And they're very happy to crawl in to safety and not have to go hunt for a safe place. Um, they started marching in and then they all marched in. Took an hour or so. It was fascinating to watch. Um,
still in April, I guess. You certainly definitely need to inspect the brood nest, see if you have a laying queen again, look for eggs. This particular picture I, I put in for fun because there's a cane. I broke my leg on a ski slope in March, so I was not doing too good watching, taking care of bees. But I sat over on uh, our little garden bed and was watching Paul from a distance inspecting the hive and um, he said how about looking at this frame and see if you can see eggs well if you carry the frame all the way over here away from the hive and hold it they're not interested in stinging you they um, they just walk around on the frame i wasn't close enough i usually never work bees without a suit and veil but in that scenario i was able to just hold that frame and help look and see if i could spot what he was looking for didn't sting. April continued. Look for a laying queen. Look for disease. Requeen colonies with laying failing queens. Make splits. Divide a strong hive into two hive bodies. Remove a frame of eggs and some brood from large colonies to form a nuke. There are lots of different ways to work with the bees in, in April. Um, a, this is a strong colony that could be divided. If you open the beehive in April, and this is what you see, those are bees, by the way. <laughs> I mean, and they're covering the whole top. Sometimes you open a hive in April, and there'll only be bees on three frames, which is what I mentioned earlier. That's a weak hive. This one is just rolling in bees. It's a good one to, to split off and make two hives out of. Another reason for having lots of equipment, extra equipment. This happens to be extra equipment at our house. <laughs> Which is more than you would expect to have for a couple years, but you gotta remember too, uh, my husband's father-in-law, my father, loaded us up with the equipment. Paul has built some of these nukes I think. Um, some of these are high bodies, some are super frames where we had hoped to have lots of honey this last year and then this It's also the result of having 12 hives in the fall and the spring only having two. <laughs> yeah, this, this, he mentioned earlier this was not a good year, but we're not going to dwell on that because hope springs eternal. We are planning a good year next year. Um, April is the time, especially if you haven't done it in March, if the weather's warm, you might, might need to be doing it in March if trees are blooming. But if the trees are blooming in April, you need to get these supers on top of the brood bodies uh, so the bees can start putting all that excess honey in. Barbara, can you, can you all add all of your supers at one time, like put more than one on a hive, or do you just do it one and then? One at a time. Um, that favorite speaker I was talking about, Kent Williams says, said in his workshop, never let the bees see the ceiling. And, and uh, what he explained about that was, yeah, put the one super on there, but when, when it starts getting half, third to half full of honey, um, they may not gather as much because they think they don't have much room. So when, when you get one super about a third full of honey, put on another one. And then they work real fast to fill that lower one, then go to fill the next one, then put on another one when it's about third full. That's just one rule of thumb. That's five beekeepers and five different things. <laughs> this, uh, this happens to be um, one summer when we had good luck with honey. We had the two hive bodies on the bottom, two deeps, and then there's one, two, three supers of honey that that one hive made. Some years a hive will make one super of honey, some years more, depending on how strong the hive was, depending on how much honey flow was ready, uh, how much nectar flow was ready when your bees were ready. Um, I don't think, I, I, what time was I supposed to be finished? 
Y'all took 10 minutes of mine talking about boxes, so uh -oh. <laughs> we might be 10 minutes. So, uh, you got about 30 minutes yet, 20 minutes. No, I don't have that much time. I am not done until they took 10 of my minutes. I won't say too much about whoops, too much about this except that it was an interesting adventure. We got to where after a few years of beekeeping you you get brave enough to try things. So we got a call about this tree and there was a, um, a feral hive up here going in and out of the top of this tree and they were trying to cut the tree down. So we gave this um, tree cutter a bee suit to wear and a smoker. He went up there and he was able to finish cutting the tree down. We, um, our uh, hope was to get the um, brood and the honey and the bees out of it what we attempted to do. We're attempting to do that. Wow. Trying to take chunks of comb and chunks of um, brood and tie it into these frames uh, was interesting. For one thing, um, we got all sticky with honey. But um, we discovered, didn't know this, but the inside of a log is not a nice round smooth surface. There's cracks in there. And so we think maybe the queen hid in the crack and we couldn't get her for two or three days. The owner kept calling us and saying, um, there's still a ball of bees out here. We'd go and get another ball of bees and another. Ultimately, what we did was to take, um, to take the log home. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> It was such a neat experience. We so wanted that hive because feral hives had been taking care of themselves without us messing with them, without pesticides, I mean, without <coughs> miticides, whatever. We figured it would be strong stock. They'd been living on their own in this tree. So, um, but we wanted to get her out. We wanted to get them out of the log. So we sat on top of it a nice upstairs and eventually the queen moved up in there. We, we had her for about six weeks and she was laying eggs and making brood. And then we went out there one day and they were all gone. I guess they decided we were the low rent district. I don't know. <laughs> they were used to being higher in a tree for whatever reason they left. But it was such a fun learning experience. Um, May, um, this might, this is actually uh, buckwheat, so this picture might have been made a little later in the summer. Anybody in here ever planted buckwheat? It's a wonderful bee food. It makes a nice, rich, dark honey. Enjoy watching bees forage for nectar and pollen. You get to where, if you start keeping bees, you get to where you're watching flowers everywhere you go. I keep my kindergarten <coughs> membership for that very reason. I like to go at different times of the spring and summer and see what bees are on. So I can plant it in my yard. <laughs> uh, I, I have this growing, Vitex, has been traditionally called a good bee food. Mountain Mint just spreads everywhere, but my bees love it, all the way from August to cold weather. Uh, sunflowers, of course, are good. Salvia, an excellent bee plant. I'm not going to name them all here. But, um, May, inspect hives for queen cells, a sign of imminent swarming. I don't think that's the hive with the cells, queen cells. Yeah, here are queen cells. Actually, this, this frame is kind of pitiful. It doesn't have much brood. This is brood. Some of that is drone brood, which is an indication when the queen starts laying too many boy bees that she's failing as a queen. She's running out of eggs. And um, these peanut shaped, they look like peanut shells. Those were queen cells. They're really called, those are emergency queen replacement cells. The, the bees have decided that queen's getting old and failing and they put a bunch of queen cells on there ready to hatch and um, that queen's, oh, maybe heaven, has already swarmed away. Um, anyway, those are some of the things you look for. May continue, remove swarm cells. Make more splits, capture swarms, prevent hives from becoming honey-bound by adding more supers. Ten Club meeting. 
repeat tasks from May and maybe begin to harvest honey. We have actually only had one June harvest. We live just four miles from here. Typically, we harvest honey July the 4th. One year, the bloom was wonderful. There was honey ready to be harvested in June, and we harvested again in July. This is a frame of capped honey ready for harvest. These are honey cappings. It's full. Uh, Virginia State beekeepers meet in the spring again to June. Harvest honey July. Paul was so proud of this. This was our top honey producing hive ever. We've never repeated it before or since, but we had one, two, three, four, five, six, and they were working on the seventh super of honey. It was really too much. We probably should have taken some of those off and harvested it and set the others on there because you can't even reach up there and lift it off. You had to drive the pickup truck back up to it and stand <laughs> on the pickup truck to lift the honey off when we were ready to harvest it. Here are supers in the house all stacked up in our where we harvest our honey newspaper to catch the drips, believe me. Drops of honey are, get everywhere when you're doing this job. And bees will come in your house and suck on those drops of honey, so you have to be careful you don't step on them and get stung. Uh, here are some frames ready to uncap and to extract. Uh, Paul is working with um, a capping knife. His is electric, and so it heats up, and he just barely has to rake it down the side of that um, frame of capped honey, and it, it rolls the cappings off into a, into a dish pan. Uh, then we set it in this extractor. This is an old extractor my dad had, but uh, we put four frames in there that have been capped, and I crank them around one direction for a while, flip them over, crank them the other direction, and get all the honey out. It's a wonderful day in the Hodge house. <laughs> Bottle and strained honey in the plastic bears. It's kind of a neat picture there when I was doing that. We, have, we, we uh, run our honey down into buckets and strain it a couple of times through something like cheesecloth. Um, and then it, it let it settle for a while and get the air bubbles out and then use one of these little gate spigots to um, fill jars, bears, whatever we want to fill. Summer picnic if you're in our club. Uh, honey ready for the state fair in the fall. A lot of people like to do that. Uh, we're back to August. Um, Next year, that, e that big convention I was telling you about meets, um, meets July 28th to August 1st. You learn a lot at a convention like that. Uh, join the Bee Club. Thank you very much.